for a, lift, a, a good uplifting thing and the song let me rhyme and we have a brother here he wants to make a statement and I was going to save it for Reverend Reed to let him do that but I think the spirit is just in it and he seems to have a lot of spirit so I like Mr. Don Bruner would you please come? good morning everyone God bless you I'm kind of uh, I'm originally from Rochester, New York. I lived in Atlanta, Georgia for three years. And uh, I lived in Macon for five. So the first time I was here was April 1st, last month. And I say that to say, I'm gonna give my testimony. And I'm hoping um, I'm not out of order. My pastor back in Rochester used to say that I, I do things unorthodox. But I'm realizing the longer I live, I, I need to be unapologetic about my worship. And the reason why I say that, after I do my song, if it's not, after I do my testimony, would you guys as a, congrega a congregation do praise him? I, I'm asking you with humility. Um, two years ago, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. One month before my birthday, my birthday is July the 4th. Coming the 4th, I'll be 68. A year later, at the treatment, it was undetectable. Cancer-free. And I, and I know cancer-free, I'm grateful that I'm cancer-free, but cancer-free is not always cancer-free. It's undetectable. So I wouldn't be in denial if it resurfaced. So, to make, to make a long story short, I want to encourage brothers to get your prostate checked. And if you happen to um, be, be diagnosed with it, include your wife from the beginning. And you know, I kind of went on into isolation when I first diagnosed. I, I laid on the couch. And sometimes God will make things uncomfortable so you will move. But in the meantime, because of the side effects, and I don't have to get into details because we all grown folks here, the side effects kind of tore me and my wife apart. Ooh, boy. And in the end we talked, she wanted a divorce. And I didn't want to stop her. And what the divorce did for me, um, when you go through a divorce, it's like a death. The marriage died and my dreams died. But I told my sisters, no matter what, 
I'm going to praise God. And even before, and, and even before the divorce was final, back in November, I had become impacted. So, you know, some of us eat a lot of macaroni and cheese, and we shouldn't. And I messed around and became dehydrated and getting ready. I'm living in Macon now, and I work here in Millersville. I was going to drive to work. Kind of nervous. I was going to drive to work, and I went to get some gas, and I was feeling nausea. I said, well, I'm going to go to Walmart and get some mineral oil, perhaps that would help me. So I called myself parking on the side of the gas station. Next thing I knew, I then drove into a pond and didn't even know it. And you know, traffic probably was coming both ways, I didn't even know it. And um, you know, guys were knocking on the window, are you okay? And I'm still thinking I'm on the side of the road resting. And then I'm coming through now and the water up to my waist. I said, help, help, help. And I didn't realize that the scriptures say that so you go through the water, it will not overflow to you. And it's when you're going through the fire, and the divorce for me was the fire, that it did not sense me. And I'm grateful that, you know, even though I felt that in the end result, my wife wasn't the ride or die wife I wanted her to be. And I can't be bitter about it. So I just want to share that who I am is my testimony. No matter where I go, I give my testimony. And I just wanted you guys to get to know me and ask you to continue to pray my scripture in the Lord. Thank you. Amen. Amen. A test more than a testimony. Brother Bruner, I can relate to what you were saying. I was diagnosed in 1997 and I had my wife by me. Throughout the worst part of it, I told we talked about this the other day. If you've never been told you have cancer, I can't tell you what it feels like. But when they lay that word on you like that, it's like uh, the, all your lights go out. And I was about like Mr. Brunner for like three or four days. I was in a tunnel. I didn't hear anything anybody was saying. The only thing in my mind was trying to get my stuff in order because I felt that that was it. That was in 1997. So every day I live, I give my testimony just as Mr. Do uh, Brother Broner does. Young men, please take care of yourself. Go get checked, don't be afraid. And I first thought when they told me to go get checked, I was talking to a friend and he was telling me about he had gone through it and what, what he, how he discovered it. So once I went to the doctor, I just said, well, I don't want to get this test done. And he told me. But when I went back, my PSA was like 17.3 when the test results came back. They didn't do anything right away. They said, we're gonna do surgery, we're gonna have to do some stuff prior to that to make it easy, easy, easier. So they put me on some stuff that gave me the same, same effects that a lady goes through hot flashes. And he told me that was gonna be like that. And I was in the choir stand, had this robe on. And that thing hit me, I'm talking about, hit me like I, my body was on fire and I'm trying to get my robe and swing it out, but it went away. So I know what it's like, but take care of yourself because God will call your number one day. It's like he's gonna call mine and we wanna be ready. I think Reverend Reed preaches it all the time about saving souls of salvation. We're gonna do a couple of songs. Yeah, he's here. Okay, I have to look back and make sure the guys are here. But this first song is designed to introduce you to a young man. I call him young, but he was an old guy sitting in the corner. And he wanted to sing in the choir. And they wouldn't let him. But when he went away, I think Brother May will tell you the rest of the story. All right. 
Good morning. Y'all doing all right? Good to be in the house of the Lord. The so what we've been through this year, God has brought them through. And I just want to tell y'all, keep on keeping on. Amen. Was a little church sitting down in the woods. At the church, they had a deacon there. Been going to this church for a long time. And early one Sunday morning, he was always bed the quadrant to, to let him sing his song. You know what that director told him? He said, oh man, you too old to sing in this choir. Say you got a tremble in your voice. I heard the old man say, when you get old, want to do you like that. When you get old, they just push you on the side. They went by church next Sunday morning And they know that the old man was sitting in the corner And they went by the next Sunday morning And the old man still was sitting in the corner And they went by the church the next Sunday morning And the old man still was sitting in the corner Finally, they heard a boss come down from heaven way. If y'all don't mind, can I let Ronnie tell you what the boss was saying? Ronnie? I found me a choir that will let me sing. You know that I Over there, 
take off these old suits we got on and put on a long white robe. Take off these old shoes we got on and put on a pair of golden slippers. And when we get there, y'all, won't be no more goodbye.
if I have to sing by myself. Well, my mother, don't sing. My father, don't sing. My sister, don't sing. Or my brother, don't sing. Well, I sing if I have to sing by myself. Sing by myself. to go for you, Jesus, I go. Get his quiet another hand. I think they're all right today this morning. Amen. I'm, I'm going I'm to go ahead and ask them now to get one ready for the closing this morning. Amen. Amen. We need to hear them one more time. <laughs> Hallelujah. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. I greet you in the name of Jesus the name above all names, none like him in all the earth, a name whereby every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is God. There is none other. He's God all by himself. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father God, I come now to tell you thank you for this day and for the blessing of life, for a fair portion of health and strength and for all things being as well with us as they are. We thank you, God, for all that our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts have felt this far in this service this morning. We know that you're with us. We know that you've not left us, and we know that you will never leave us for you promised that you'd never forsake us. So God, we pray now that you'll be with us as we go through this service. Come, O Holy Spirit, take charge of me, my physical body, my tongue, my mind, and all that's within me, God. Speak to me and through me as you open the hearts, minds, and the ears of these your people that they may hear and receive and be doers of your perfect will. I pray your blessings upon the church this morning, wherever it might be, all of the believers. And Lord, if there be one in the midst today, anywhere that's listening, I pray that you'll touch that heart, him or her, that they too will come into the fold so that they will not be lost eternally. Bless through your word today, God. Use me in a mighty way. Preach now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 I am so happy to be back in God's house again today. It is nothing but a blessing from the Lord. Another blessing from the Lord to all of you in your respective places today. I greet you and I ask you to pray with me and for me as we move forward in this message today. I'm not going to prolong the time. I'm going to call your attention to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 11. Your leisure, I'd 
like for you to read the first 24 verses. I'm going to read uh, for you today um, verses 20 through 23. from the New International Version, Romans chapter 11, beginning at verse 20. It says, Granted, but they that were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith, do not be arrogant, but tremble. For did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fail, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Amen. You may be seated. I, I think that's enough reading. I, I'm going to pray that the Lord will reveal to us in this message today the point that he is wishing to get across. For a subject today, we're going to talk about the great debate. That is, once saved, always saved. The great debate. A uh, few weeks ago, one of my Bible study scholars called me up. We have about 40 or 50 of them that are on the line each weekend. I invite you to join us because we have some pretty uh, vigorous discussions from time to time. But this was not one of the discussions. This was just a question that was on her heart. And she called me up and she said, Pastor, once saved, always saved. Well, now. We talked about that thing for a little while, and, and, and after we concluded, I thought that, Lord, maybe there are a whole lot of folk who are wondering about the same thing. So God, give me something to take to your people so that they'll understand. I, I've been preaching for 39 years, and I've never preached this message. And it's one that I should have thought about myself because there have been times when I had to wonder, Lord, am I still the same? <laughs> we, we've all had those moments, right? So, so, so I started doing a little digging and the Lord has blessed us with a, a word this morning in my reading, I came across a couple of stories that I'm hoping that will enlighten you just a little bit. The first one uh, was about a couple who were visiting the Oregon Cave uh, National Monument up in Oregon. And, and while there, they thought that they would take a few samples, Brother Robert. And, uh, and to bring back with them, you know. So, so after they they got on the tour, the guide told them directly. He said, "Now, don't mess with the formations. Don't take nothing." <laughs> he said, "Now we've never had very much of a problem with this." And he said, "I don't know whether." Uh, it's because of the visitor's great love for nature. He said, I don't know whether it's their desire for, for the preservation of the caves or their respect for the $500 fine. Now, 
get that one on the way home. The second one, similar to the first one. On a sightseeing trip to Florida's West Coast, there were a couple who decided to visit an old mansion. Um, in its exquisitely furnished master bedroom, they were surprised to see a sign on the bedspread and the curtains that read, wash hands immediately after touching. Now, on the way out, it had spurred the curiosity of this brother's wife. So she asked the guide there, she said, uh, I noticed the signs. Did, did y'all spray some kind of harmful preservative on the curtains in the bed? And the guy just laughed. He said, no, ma'am. We, we didn't put anything on them. He said, we just never did have very much luck with our signs that said, do not touch. How many of you know that fear is a powerful motivator? <laughs> fear is a powerful motivator. It's, it, 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 it's, it's often mentioned in scripture. Matter of fact, I think there are about 47 scriptures that talks about fear. Now, I know that somebody's going to say, well, that's just the Old Testament, Reverend. But no. No, that's not true. Peter writes that Christians should show proper respect to everyone. He said, love the brotherhood of believers, fear God, and honor the king. That's in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 17. Now, somebody else is going to say, well, Reverend, yeah, that's probably true, but Hey, uh, fear that's used in the Bible simply means respect. Okay. Sometimes it means respect. No question. But not in this particular case. The word in 1 Peter, for example, is phobio. P-H-O-B-E-O. -E phobio is a word from which we get our term, uh, uh, phobia. Everybody ought to know what a phobia is. It's, it, it's, 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 it's a fear. It's a fear that puts trembling in your heart. You know, you, 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 close places for some people. They, they can't stand elevators. They, some can't stand to see a snake cross the road. They just freeze up. Some can't stand to see uh, a, a spider. You know what I'm talking about. Phobio is found again in Romeo in Romans 11 and 20. It says, Peter said, uh, uh, Paul says, "Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. Be afraid." I, I gotta I gotta share this one because this is real. I've got a friend, close friend. I would call his name, but somebody might try this on him. He, he, he's, he's a pretty bad fella. He's a wonderful gentleman, but he doesn't play a lot. He, he, he means what he says, says what he means, and, and he actually knocked a few folks out that were much bigger than him. I mean, just ping, ping, ah. Not afraid of anything, you would think, because... He's just one of them fearless folks. He can pick up snakes and play with them. But I can cut a picture of a spider out of a magazine and run him out the country. <laughs> you know who you are. I know you're going to see this message today. <laughs> Afraid. Afraid of what? Well, the church at Rome had a problem. 
it was not necessarily just a small problem, but it was, it was a problem that required some attention. The congregation there was made up of Jewish and Gentile believers. And there was a certain tension between these two groups. The Jewish believers at Rome apparently looked down their noses at the Gentiles because the Gentiles were, 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 were the late comers. They were the new kids on the block, the Johnny come lately, if you, if you will. So these non-Jews had not been part of God's first covenant with Israel and, and hadn't taken part in the blessings and the promises of the Old Testament. Besides, for generations, there, there had been dislike and hatred for these outsiders. Gentiles were called dogs by the Jews. And contact with these undesirables were avoided at all costs unless they just had to come in contact with them. Now, if a Jew were to buy something from the market from a Gentile, they take that purchase home and, and wash it as thoroughly as they could to clean away the pagan filth, so they called it, before they used it. Oh. Jews grew up hating Gentiles, and it was a habit that was hard to break. You, you remember the story of the, uh, 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 of the Samaritans? It, it, it was one of those stories where the Jews, if they were going to, to Jerusalem and coming, coming, coming out of uh, uh, Israel, they, they'd go around, three-day journey, just to avoid having contact with them. So Paul spends the first four or five chapters of the book of Romans addressing this prejudice on their part. So for their part, the Gentiles apparently were not taking this sitting down. They seemed to have responded to Jewish prejudice by pointing out the fact that if the Jews were so smart, then why did they reject Jesus in the first place? If you were so smart. And besides that, how could you possibly maintain that God loves Jews more than Gentiles when the Jews crucified God's son? Chapters 9, 10, and 11 of Romans, Paul focused on countering this attitude on their part. Paul said, in essence, God has not rejected Israel. In fact, he loves Israel. It's hard to tell you how bad this finger pointing thing had gotten at Rome, but, but it merited Paul's intervention. So in Romans 15, verses 7 through 9, Paul says, Accept one another. Then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy as it is written. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. So it's here. In chapter 11, that Paul sums up his rebuke of the Gentile believers in Rome. He sets the record straight. Yes, the Jews were cut off, but they were cut off because of unbelief. And yes, you Gentiles have been grafted in. You've been taken in, in their place. But, and that's a big but. Don't be so smug about this because you too can be cut off. You're a part. You're a part of the kingdom. But it doesn't take much for you to be cut out. 
or as Paul writes in Romans 11, 19 through 21, you will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted. But they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. There are people who have problems with this apparent teaching from Romans. They would suggest that it's unbiblical for a person to fear losing their salvation. They maintain that once a person is saved, they will always be saved. That's the great debate. Let me give you a couple of examples. One author maintained that God's elect are unconditionally secure in Christ and that it's impossible for a true believer to ever become an unbeliever or for a saved sinner to ever become unsaved or for a redeemed person to ever become unredeemed or for one of God's elect to ever become non-elect. And to teach otherwise, he says, is to teach the nonsense of conditional grace and conditional salvation is to teach salvation by works. We know. We know. That's an opinion from one author. But let me give you another one. This author said, addressing the issue of the people who have given their lives to Jesus, gone to church for many years, but then left the church never to return. He explains here. He said, we have all seen it happen. And I would like to say that they have probably never been saved. He says, if they left the faith and stayed away, then they were never saved. They didn't lose their salvation. They simply never had it to begin with. And the reason they fell away from and stayed away is because they were never saved. Oh, what a debate. This is a great debate. A great debate. This type of teaching can be so intense that it, it can cause some of the believers to question the salvation uh, 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 with their own doubt. Let me see. I had a friend named Gary. Gary had a visit from one of those door-to-door -door evangelists. He came by Gary's house, and, and he asked Gary, he said, Gary, you, sir, have you ever been, are you saved? Gary said, yeah. He said, well, when were you saved? He said, I was baptized about a year ago. And then he raised the question, he said, have you ever doubted your salvation? Now, if you ask me that question, you already know what my answer is. And Gary gave my answer. He said, yeah. I, I doubted my salvation. So the preacher then tried to convince Gary that if he doubted his salvation, then he wasn't saved. And then he tried to lead Gary in a prayer of salvation. Right on the spot. Well now. I've got problems with these gentlemen. That's just me. How can you tell me that I can't be cut off from my salvation when the book of Romans says that I can. Let's see now. 
are these people who are making these arguments, are, 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 are they totally ignoring the scripture? No. No, they're not. It's just that the scriptures that they use to support the position that people can't walk away from their salvation don't totally say what these people believe that they are doing. All right, let's see. One such scripture is John 10, verses 27 through 29. Here John says that my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. So what does this mean? It means that once I'm saved, nobody can take my salvation away from me. That's what it means. Now pay close attention to this, my brothers and sisters. You can steal my car. You can burn my house down. You can kill my family. But you cannot take my salvation away from me. I don't care if you're an army with big guns, nuclear weapons. I don't care if you're a terrorist who brought your lethal weaponry with you. You cannot take my salvation. However, that's the conjunction here. However, that does not mean that I cannot get up and walk away from God. I want that to sink in with you. Because we got too many folk who, who are thinking that they're on their way to heaven when actually they are on their way to hell because they have walked away from God. Let me, let me, let me, let me get back to it. The Bible tells me in Romans 11 and 22, it says, Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fail, but kindness to you. Provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. In 1 Corinthians 15 and 2, we're told, by the gospel, you are saved. But there's a conjunction here, too. Make a pen right there. By the gospel, you are saved. Conjunction. Two letters. I F. I F. If you hold firmly to the word that I preach. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Jesus declared in John 15 and 6, if anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that has been thrown away to wither, and such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. As Hebrew warns, how shall we escape, here's that two-letter word again, if we neglect so great a salvation? How can you escape? But, let's look at the bright side. Those of us who believe in once saved, always saved, that is a point here. How do I avoid living an abject fear all of my life? Afraid of losing my salvation when I'm not looking. Pay close attention. How? 
do I avoid living in abject fear all of my life? Afraid of losing my salvation when I'm not looking. Let's look at a couple of things. You can't lose your salvation. Because it's not like misplacing your car keys or your eyeglasses. Okay? You don't just wake up one morning and start looking for your salvation and not being able to remember what you did with it. It's not like that. No one can take your salvation away from you. Jesus will not allow that to happen. Salvation is something you have to deliberately walk away from. You got to do it on purpose. Let me give you an illustration. A story I once read in Reader's Digest, a man was explaining that during a mortgage closing on his summer house, his wife and he were asked to sign some documents that contained a whole lot of small print. You know how that goes. So he says, when I ask uh, the attorney if I should read it, he said to him, he said, legally you should, but here's the bottom line. If you make your mortgage payments on time and pay your taxes, there's nothing in here that can harm you. But, <laughs> that's another big but, should you stop paying don't pay your taxes and make your mortgage payment. There is definitely nothing in here, in the small print, that can save you. Amen? I, I, I wanna, I, I'm, I'm trying to get this clarified. I want you to understand this today. You see, I, I own my house. Me and the bank. <laughs> And, and, and as long as I make that monthly payment and keep my taxes paid, then I'm all right. That's my house. I, <laughs> I, I know the bank don't want it. They want that check every month. <laughs> they ain't spending about the house. But I need it because I got to have somewhere to lay down. I be tired when I get home. <laughs> I need my own kitchen, so in the middle of the night when I need a little snack, I can ease in there. <laughs> However, you know, I, I used to be a landlord back prior to 2009. 2008, we had a big crash, and I, I, I got rid of all my stuff. But I had bought up a whole lot of abject properties, and they were properties that I bought primarily on courthouse steps. Properties that had been abandoned by people who didn't pay their mortgages primarily and didn't pay their taxes. So they just walked away. And ultimately, the properties were foreclosed. Y'all following? That's what Paul said about the Jews. They walked away from God's gift for them. Do you remember why Paul said that? Why did he say that they were cut off? I want you to go over and read Romans 11 and 20 again. Romans 11 and 20. The Jews were broken off because of unbelief. What can I tell you? God brought you in because you kept the faith. Faith makes the difference. He said, don't be arrogant. 
but be afraid. If, 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 if you go back to my first couple of stories, being afraid, don't, you know, wash your hands right after you touch that. <laughs> Fear will keep you anchored. There is only one sin that's unforgivable. What is it? Blasphemy. What is blasphemy? Blasphemy says that there is no God. There is no God. So if there is no God, then how can you be forgiven? There's nobody to forgive you. Simple. If you have unbelief, then you are done. They weren't cut off because they slipped and sinned. They weren't cut off for lying and stealing and cheating. They weren't even cut off for killing. They weren't cut off because they cussed the preacher out. That's not why they were cut off. They refused to believe. That's why they were cut off. They didn't want what God had to offer, so they proudly turned their backs on all that God wanted to give them, and God cut them off. But now, here's the cool part. This is how our God is. Romans 11 and 23. He says, and if they do not perish in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Amen? God is able to graft them. He's able to bring them back again. Now, while the bad news is that you can't walk away, you, that you can walk away from your salvation, that you can walk away from, that's bad news. You can. Don't you get to thinking that once saved, always saved. If you walk away, you're on your own. The good news is this. If you return to God, God will open up his arms and receive you back into his kingdom. That make any difference about what you've done, even if you've wandered so far away from him that you don't think that you could ever get back, God will take you back. We got too many of us who are running around saying that I've committed the unforgivable sin. Lord, I know you can't forgive me for all that stuff I did. You've been begging God for 30 years to forgive you for the same thing that he forgave you for the day that you asked him the first time. I once knew a woman who, who, who worried about her salvation. She, she'd grown up in basically the same community with me. She was, she was in the church as a teenager. But a little later on in life, she, she developed some habits that led her from one degree of sin into another degree of sin, from drugs and the prostitution and only God knows what else. But ultimately, she decided that she needed to go back to where she came from because she was raised right. Grew up in the church. This is, this is, this is not just her story. This is my story. This is your story. We've all been there. She came to me, and as a young preacher, I was fearful that I, didn't, I wouldn't know what to tell her because her, her situation was dire. She was desperate for the forgiveness of God. And I had to, I had to come up with something. So I prayed on this thing, and God gave me exactly what I needed. He, he told me, he told me, a story. 15th chapter of St. Luke. 
He said, that was a man who had two sons. And his youngest boy said, Dad, I want my inheritance. Now, of course, he didn't have an inheritance. Everything at his daddy's house belonged to his daddy. Inheritances are after death. But his daddy was such kind-hearted man that he divided his share. And the boy packed up and went away into a far country. I told this man. And there he spent all of his inheritance on wild living. If he could buy it, he paid for it. Up until he didn't have nothing else to, to buy anything with. And then a famine came into the land, and there was nobody who would give him anything. The only job that he could get was in a pig pen. And you know Jews and pigs, they just don't go together. Jews don't eat pork. And, and this boy says that he, he, he was, he was such, so hungry that he, he wanted to eat what the pigs were eating. And then he thought about it. Hallelujah. He said, my father has servants who has food enough to give away. And here I am in a pit pit. He said, let me tell you what I'm going to do. He said, I'm going back to my father. He said, I'm going to tell my daddy. He said, I'm going to tell daddy. He says, I'm going to tell daddy that, that I'm, I'm, I'm no longer fit to be your son. But if you'll just make me a hired hand. This boy is still in the pig pen. Listen to me when I tell you. He's still in the pig pen when he came to himself. That's where repentance starts. It starts while you're still in the pig pen. That's where repentance is. He said, I have sinned against heaven. So I'm going to tell my dad. I've sinned against heaven and against you. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But make me a house. And he's took out. He headed home. I don't know. What kind of dad is you've had? But this boy had a good one. His daddy was, was watching for him. Hallelujah. The God that we serve, he sees all, he knows all, he's watching. He knows your heart. He knows when you're sincere in your penance. He was waiting. Look at down the road. Can you, can you see him? He, he see this figure in the distance coming down the road. And, and it looked like himself. His, his movement is like my movement. And the boy wasn't walking fast enough for the man to see. So, so he decided to go meet him. He said, it's got to be my boy. It's got to be my boy. And there, the boy saw his dad. And his dad ran and grabbed him on the neck. And the boy started repenting to his dad. He said, Dad, I'm a, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And, 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 and his dad said, whoa, 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 whoa. Somebody, go get this boy the best robe. Get a ring and put on his finger. Get some shoes and put on his feet for my son. My son 
who was who was dead is alive again. God can't wait to accept you back. He loves us unconditionally. It's on you. It's on you. You need to notice this man didn't go looking for his son. God didn't make us zombies. He didn't make us puppets. Gave you a will. Whatever you choose is the, what God is going to respect. If you choose to go to hell, then go to hell. But if you want to go to heaven, there's a reservation for you. Jesus is, has already done all that he's going to do. He died. He died. so that you could live. Yes, there's bad news. We can be cut off of God. If we insist on living in some foreign land and selfishness and sin and any kind of way. But there's good news. The best news is that God will accept you back. Y'all ought to give the Lord a hand praise. We're going to open the doors of the church right here. That may be somebody who's waiting to come home. God is waiting on you. So as the choir sings, you can come and give me your hand, but give your heart to the Lord. Amen. to sing that one more time like you know it now. Come unto Jesus while you have time. Come He will 
take care of you. Um, Hallelujah. 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 We've done as the Lord has commanded and we find one. Glory to God. We serve such an awesome God. Woo! <laughs> I just get lost in him. Can't do nothing without him. Don't want to go nowhere and leave him. And I'm glad he holds on to me. Now, sometimes my grip gets a little weak. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Uh, the disciple said, I got that off right. <laughs> it's a sin thing. Yeah, I'm saved. I'm saved. Hallelujah, I'm saved. And I ain't leaving God. But every once in a while, I do something foolish. And I'm going to tell you straight up. Whether I know it or not, sometimes I do foolish stuff, don't even know it's foolish. But we find one. And I'm going to let him talk to you, tell you what, you, what he want to do. Well, well, unfortunately, Pastor, I talked to him before you came in. I gave my testimony. Okay. But I thank God that for all of us, but specifically me, this, this day was ordained even before I was born. Um, I'm not new to the church. I'm new here. I was in the church. I'm a member of Lizzie Chapel Baptist Church in Macon, Georgia. Pastor Ronald, Tern, uh, Ronald Tony. Pastor know, know real well. And the reason why I say it was ordained because I made a commitment when I came to Milledgeville, that I was going to find a church home, but also was going to, uh, God bless me with being diagnosed with prostate cancer. And I was in the process while I was still in Macon, Georgia, uh, developing a prevention intervention, uh, prostate cancer pre pre prevention intervention for black men. And I made a commitment to pastor that I would look into is there a possibility of collaboration. Something with Macon and, Mil and Milledgeville. We all we identify as, as, as being in Middle Georgia. Both lake, both locations is Middle Georgia. So I'm here on a Christian experience and hope of taking it a step further and becoming a mem member of Flag Baptist. Hallelujah. 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 Brother Bruna. Amen. He came here a few weeks back. And uh, he was not to be the tear. You know, we got some pretty strict guidelines around here, and 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 and, and, and he was at the door. <laughs> he was at the door. He figured out a way. Now, no, there's a, but there's a wheel. He made it in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> he made it in. And he's been faithful. I, he came and he told me, he said, he said, I know you know my pastor, Reverend Tony. Tony and I have been, been friends for years, 20 plus years, long time. Before he went to Macon, he was, he was my friend. And uh, I think I saw him the other day. Yeah. You told him? Yeah. Uh, I, I think he lives in my neighborhood. I just hadn't hadn't stopped his house. House looked like the church. <laughs> Sits up on top of a big hill and it is gorgeous. And at first I saw him, I said, well, maybe that's the help. <laughs> okay. <laughs> at any rate, this brother has come and he has, he has given us his desire to be here under Christian experience and um, I'm going to accept him 
on behalf of Flag Chapel Missionary Baptist Church. And at a time when we can extend to you the right hand of fellowship, we'll do that. But until then, consider yourself at home and a full member of the Flag Chapel Missionary Baptist Church. Amen. Let the church say amen. Say amen again. Y'all say it one time like you mean it now. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, and amen. Okay. One other little uh, house cleaning item here that we need to do before we get out of here. Uh, Deacon Martin uh, has come across some food boxes. Amen. And there is planning a big food giveaway. You know how we do it. We've been, we've been at this for a little while, but he needs some volunteers. Amen. Deacon Martin right there. He just walked over and gave me this little pink piece of paper. And I want you to tell him that you're willing to help. I'm going to ask uh, the missionary, not the missionaries, the Benevolent uh, Society, Benevolent uh, Club, if you will kind of spearhead this along with Deacon Martin because it's going to be a pretty good undertaking. I understand that there may be close to 500 boxes. So it's a pretty good size uh, uh, venture. And certainly we can't, we can't ask Deacon Martin to do that by himself. He, he'd get up on Friday morning, hitch that trailer up and go to Atlanta and get some bread by himself. And, 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 and I'm praying that we get some volunteers, some more volunteers to help him with that. He's been doing that for a long time and he's had some help, amen? But, you know, the, the word of God is, the word of God says that man can't live by bread alone. But didn't say that we didn't need no bread. We need some bread. <laughs> we need some bread to go along with the word of God. And Deacon Martin has found that. Thank God for, for my, my children up in Atlanta, John and Marla. Amen. I, I raised them children. And they came down and blessed us with this ministry. And Deacon Martin took it upon himself to follow up with it, and I thank him for that. Amen. So if you're willing to help out with the, uh, the food giveaway, please touch bases with Deacon Martin. Amen? I love y'all. I love y'all. God is awesome. I love you because God loves me, and I know he does. I know he does. I, uh, there's nothing like this, this this feeling. How do you know that God loves you? It's, it's just a feeling. But it's a feeling that you know. Because he moves on the inside of you. He makes you do right when you want to do wrong. Amen. Amen. That's, that's the feeling. Sister Diane, Sister Margaret, that's, that's the feeling. Amen. Come on, let's let's do the closing song, lady. Let us stand. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end Amen ah. Grace of God, the love of Christ, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with you as people now and forevermore. Let every heart sing. Amen Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may go in peace. If you need Deacon Martin's number, it's 363-2971. 363 363-2971.